So I, th I think it was Zeke who tweeted that maybe we could have the game on here, but I, I couldn't make that happen. So any updates would be appreciated. Uh, did somebody say what? They don't know what I'm talking about? What's going on? Hockey. Hockey. Uh, I let the president uh, do the gambling. Uh, well, I also had uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the president and I are both hopeful that uh, Team USA will uh, prevail. Come on, game's not over, uh, and that he'll break even. I was very disappointed we all were by the heartbreaking loss uh, suffered yesterday by USA women in hockey. It was an amazing game. I don't have any other uh, things to talk about at the top, so <laughs> we'll uh, go straight to your questions. Nedra. Thanks, Jay. We saw your statement on uh, welcoming the agreement in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. What's the President's message for President Putin today in our phone call? Uh, the President uh, either is right now uh, or uh, is about to speak with President Putin. Uh, and uh, obviously they will talk about Ukraine and we'll have a fuller readout uh, of that conversation uh, after it's uh, been completed. The fact of the matter is uh, it is in Russia's interest for uh, the violence to end in Ukraine uh, as it is in the interest of the United States and our European friends and, of course, most importantly, the Ukrainian people. And we welcome the uh, cessation of violence and we welcome the agreements that have been reached and we uh, and the measures that have been passed through the parliament. We're still at an implementation stage and we monitor this very closely. I'm sure these issues will all be discussed uh, in that conversation. And uh, I think as uh, my colleague Tony Blinken noted uh, not long ago, uh, you know, it, our, our European friends, foreign ministers from uh, uh, Germany, uh, Poland, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, had, were very much engaged, as, as were the Russians in, uh, and France, sorry, France, uh, Poland, and Germany were very much engaged, and Russia observed uh, the agreement and uh, uh, Russia's efforts uh, on behalf of creating this ceasefire and these agreements uh, were obviously welcome. Uh, China said that the meeting that the President had with the Dalai Lama would um, damage relations. Um, is the President concerned about that? The President, as he has in the past on several occasions and as uh, presidents of both parties have done, uh, dating back to 1991, met today, as uh, we said in the readout, with His Holiness, uh, the Dalai Lama, in his capacity as an internationally res respected religious and cultural uh, leader. The, when it comes to the relationship the United States has with China, uh, the President and the Dalai Lama agreed on the importance of a positive and constructive uh, U.S.-China uh, relationship. And of course, uh, we are committed to a constructive relationship with China uh, in which we work together to solve regional and global problems. So again, this is in keeping with past practice, uh, the meeting the President had today with His Holiness uh, in his uh, capacity as a respected religious and cultural leader. Does China's um, objection to that meeting have any um, role to play in why there wasn't any media access allowed for the visit today? The, I certainly understand uh, the interest in having media access. The uh, meeting the President had today in, in the Dalai Lama's capacity as a religious and cultural leader. Uh, has uh, was in keeping with past practice, and uh, you know we have been working, as you know, to provide uh, more access uh, uh, to photographers as well as to all of you. And uh, in this case, we weren't able to do that, uh, but we have been working uh, on that effort. Why weren't you able yeah. to do that? Yeah, well, uh, April, I would simply say that uh, there will never be a day for me or my successors uh, in administrations well into the future where those who occupy the seats in front of me are satisfied with the level of access. And uh, which is not to dismiss uh, the interest in, uh, but which I think are legitimate, uh, access to uh, the President. Uh, but only to say that we, you know, I know that we won't succeed even in, as we make efforts to expand access to 
uh, get you access to everything you'd like to have access to. In past, past practice, the Dalai Lama has even come out to stake out. To well, we don't. The, the, nobody, the uh, obviously, anybody who uh, leaves the building is free to talk to the press. Yeah. What uh, diplomatic efforts were made ahead of the meeting to tell China that it was going to happen? Um, specifically, did Secretary Kerry mention that the meeting would be happening during <laughs> his recent visit to China? Uh, I don't have specific readouts, specific conversations. We are in contact with our Chinese counterparts uh, on a regular basis at a variety of levels. So um, I don't have anything specific on uh, a conversation around this particular visit. We're in regular contact with the Chinese. So did the White House give advance notice? Uh, again, I just don't have a specific uh, readout on, 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 uh, on that. I can tell you that we're in conversations with the Chinese at a variety of levels on a whole panoply of subjects. Yeah. Um, and I understand that um, he was here in D.C. doing other things, meeting with other people, but do you have any information about how this meeting at the White House came about, whether it was something the White <coughs> House asked for or whether he asked for it? No, uh, beyond what you just said, which is that he was here uh, uh, on other business uh, and that this is uh, similar to the meetings that pr this president and other presidents have had with uh, His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama in the past, I don't have any background on how this particular meeting came about, but I would point to the uh, similarity in this uh, between this meeting and, and past meetings between uh, His Holiness and uh, President Obama and previous presidents. Lastly, does the agreement in Ukraine basically mean that the U.S. no longer needs to apply further sanctions and can put the so-called <coughs> tool toolkit back on the shelf? Well, I, I think that's a great question, and what I would say is that our focus today is on working with our European partners as well as the government and opposition in Ukraine to ensure the agreement's implementation. And we are not ruling out sanctions to hold those responsible for the violence accountable, uh, especially should there be further violence or violation of the agreement. Right now we're focused on the implementation of the agreement. We obviously welcome the steps that have been taken. The steps that have been taken uh, are entirely consistent with what the President advocated, uh, including uh, calling for a de-escalation of the violence, constitutional change, a coalition government, and early elections. All. Uh, all of that has either happened in terms of the de-escalation of violence thus far and uh, or it, uh, is included in uh, the agreement that has been reached. So uh, we consider this a positive development, mindful of the fact that uh, the agreement is one thing, implementation is another, and we're going to be closely monitoring that with our European friends, as well as working with the Ukrainians. Jim. I uh, wanted to ask you about uh, the President's uh, warning to the Ukrainians on Wednesday. He warned there would be consequences if people step over the line. Uh, then that truce uh, broke apart on Thursday, but then the Vice President called again over Ukraine and, and warned the Ukrainian President to pull back his forces, talked about sanctions. Do you think the President's warnings had an impact? I think that there has been a concerted uh, and fairly uniform reaction around the world to what happened in Ukraine. And uh, you've seen uh, our European uh, partners act and express their extreme concern. You saw the President uh, do so, and you saw uh, Prime Minister Harper, obviously, uh, together with the President in, in Mexico. And, and uh, as you noted, the Vice President has been clear with uh, President Yanukovych what our position is and what <laughs> actions we were prepared to take. And, what actions we already have taken, as you know, the visa bans that apply to those responsible for the violence. So uh, I think that as a general matter, it was fairly clear how the world uh, viewed what was happening in Ukraine uh, and uh, with, uh, in particular, how the United States and uh, France and Germany and Poland and other countries viewed what was happening. And the President, uh, with respect to his phone call with President Putin, uh, which may be happening now, uh, the President said on Wednesday this is not a, an international chess game that he's having with President Putin. But there is, <coughs> wouldn't you agree, a, a tug of war between the West and Russia over Ukraine. Isn't that sort of what's playing out? No. And I think I have a little deeper expertise in this matter than perhaps some others. And I would say that it is profoundly different from the Cold War era in that what we've seen in recent weeks and months is uh, the expressed desire of 
the Ukrainian people for a future that they decide on their own, for themselves, for their nation. And uh, that desire expressed by Ukrainians on the street through peaceful protests, and it was the reaction to that, the unacceptable reaction to that, that led to the violence that we saw. So uh, the President is correct when he says that this is not about the United States and Russia or the West and Russia. This is about Ukraine and the Ukrainian people and their desire for um, the right to choose their own destiny, the right to a government that represents them and their interests. Uh, and what we have seen at least the potential for in the last 24 hours is uh, an agreement that reflects and responds to the desires expressed by the Ukrainian people. And just to get to the President's remarks to the, mm -hmm. to the DGA last night, he said that uh, perhaps uh, Democrats don't view midterms as sexy enough. Mm -hmm. uh, is he worried that his party is getting complacent? No, I think the President was reflecting pretty established uh, information when it comes to turnout in midterm elections. Uh, I'm confident that in individual races and in districts and states, uh, as well as at the national level, that the Democratic Party and uh, its candidates will make every effort to turn out voters because every election matters and participation in our democracy is what makes it work and what makes it function and what makes it responsive to the American people. So, but I think that for as long as I've been around and uh, th that reflects a fact about uh, at least patterns of turnout uh, when it comes to midterms versus presidential years. He, re he referred to the 2010 midterms as a shellacking. Is he worried about another shellacking that's on the horizon here? No. In fact, uh, the President's confident that um, Democrats are unified behind an agenda that is focused on expanding opportunity and rewarding hard work and rewarding Americans who take responsibility for themselves and their families. It's reflected specifically in policy proposals that Democrats support and are pushing uh, and that the American people support and want their representatives to take action on. Uh, so I think, as I said the other day, you know, we're, we're confident that that agenda is one that is welcomed by the American people, and, and that will be reflected in the election. Let me move around a little bit up and back. Jeff. Um, just getting back to the Dalai Lama for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, does the meeting itself with the Dalai Lama, from the White House perspective, mean that the U.S. supports his call for an autonomous Tibet? Support his call for? An autonomous Tibet. The United States supports the Dalai Lama's middle way approach of neither assimilation nor independence for Tibetans in China. The United States recognizes Tibet to be a part of the People's Republic of China, and we do not support Tibetan independence. The U.S. strongly supports human rights and religious freedom in China. We are concerned about continuing tensions and the deteriorating human rights situation in Tibetan areas of China. We will continue to urge the Chinese government to resume dialogue with the Dalai Lama or his representatives without preconditions as a means to reduce tensions. So that's our view, and it's, uh, uh, that view reflects our concern about continuing tensions and the deteriorating uh, human rights situation in Tibetan areas of China. John. Uh, just to follow up on Ukraine um, and the Russian role, what, what is the White House view on how unhelpful Russia was in what we have seen unfold over the past several days, weeks. And <coughs> were you suggesting now and with, with this, uh, this agreement that the Russians have played a constructive role in, uh, in the emergence of this agreement? Here's what I would say in, in, in the first part of the question. There's the, the conflict arose out of uh, the disappointment and, and dissatisfaction that the Ukrainian people felt about decisions made by the government that didn't reflect their will when it came to uh, their desire uh, to be integrated into Europe. And uh, again, so that's about the views of the Ukrainian people. When it comes to uh, 
the fact that an agreement was reached, there's no question that uh, the efforts of the French, Polish, and German foreign ministers, as well as the United States, the President, the Vice President, Secretary Kerry and our diplomats uh, helped uh, precipitate the agreement and, and Russia witnessed the agreement in part and, and uh, was uh, played an important role in that respect. So I, I think that reflects what the President said uh, and what others have said and that is that it is in uh, Russia's interest that Ukraine uh, not be engulfed in violence, Kiev or other places, and that it return to uh, stability and that, in, and that progress be made towards uh, a future in Ukraine that reflects the will of the Ukrainian people. So it's very important to view this not as um, a tug of war between <coughs> East and West or the United States and Russia, but uh, a a discussion that led to confrontation and violence, but hopefully now is retreating from that, but then will result in progress forward uh, on behalf of a Ukrainian people, a proud people and a great nation that desire uh, the right to determine their own future. And uh, that's something the United States unequivocally supports. Is there, there was some concern that uh, after the, the end of the Olympics, once the Olympics are over, that uh, kind of uh, any restraint uh, could be off and the Russians would be less concerned about uh, uh, the optics of having this kind of violence at their doorstep and things could get worse post-Olympics. Is there any? Well, we're going to constantly monitor the situation in Ukraine uh, as the, the agreements that have been reached have been impl uh, are being implemented. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, we are prepared to uh, take a quick action on other measures, including sanctions, should violence uh, return in Ukraine. And I think you would see uh, similar uh, reaction from uh, European nations. I, I guess in answer to that question, I would simply note that what we saw happen graphically and horrifically in Ukraine happened this week while the Olympics were ongoing. So if, if I can just ask one point about the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. uh, was the White House's decision not to allow photographers in, uh, in, in part made not to offend the Chinese? Obviously, the previous presidents have met with the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, um, and, and done in, in under very similar circumstances, but have allowed, you know, a, a, a coverage, photo coverage. So was the administration worried about going too far in upsetting the Chinese and <coughs> not allowing photographers in to cover this? John, what I can tell you is that I, I'm absolutely uh, appreciative of the interest in having access to a meeting like this. Uh, it uh, occurred in much the same way as past meetings that President Obama has had with His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama and uh, in his capacity as an internationally respected religious and cultural leader, the uh, you know the fact is we don't the, the, you know we don't have photographers in every meeting the president has, uh, but we are uh, mindful of the interest that uh, there is in these kinds of meetings and and work to provide as much access as we can. I mean, this somebody represents what seven million Tibetans mm -hmm. and Buddhists, many millions elsewhere around the world. Uh, this is not just any old. You know, meeting. I mean, you could see there'd be intense interest in, in in coverage of this. And, and again, there there'd have been precedent for for having some coverage of this. Well, well, I mean, I'm, I'm just you know, the answer. Yeah. I don't think you directly answered my question, which sure. is, was this decision not to allow coverage of this made in part uh, so as not to further offend the Chinese who were already well, upset? This meeting. The answer I, I have for you, John, is that this you know the approach we took was similar to the approach we've taken in the past, and. Uh, the fact of the meeting is well known. The, uh, our views on uh, uh, Tibet uh, and uh, the need for respect for uh, religious freedom uh, are as they were, and uh, you know I'm expressing them again today. Uh, so uh, that's the context I would view it in. I don't I don't have a parsing of the decisions we make about uh, when they're going to be a photo access. Major.
If you'll come back to me, Jay, I'll yield to Connie for a question. If you'll come back. Connie. Thank you so much, Major. This is about Cuban American prisoners and emailed you about. Our National Press Club, Club group had a session at the Cuban Interest Section the other night on the 19th. I asked the chief or the ambassador, Jose Cabanas, what it would take to free Alan Gross from a Cuban prison, whether he's guilty or innocent, that's irrelevant. Later he said to me, what about the three remaining prisoners in U.S. jails? Now he said he'd like to talk to somebody in the White House about this situation. He calls it a human rights situation. He doesn't want to call it prisoner swap or prisoner exchange. And he doesn't appear to want to go through the Swiss. So my question is, are there any direct talks going on to try to resolve this human rights situation? Would the U.S. be willing to have that? Well, we are very concerned about Alan Gross. We've expressed very clearly that he ought to be released immediately, and we've made that view clear to uh, the Cuban government, and we have uh, uh, we work on this issue all the time. I don't have any uh, conversations to read out to you, but it remains uh, a concern of ours uh, that we are focused on. But would the U.S. change policy and talk directly to Cuba about this? Again, we, we, we have conversations uh, the, the, all the time that make very clear uh, our views on this matter. Uh, and uh, I don't think it is a mystery at all to the Cubans uh, that we believe he ought to be released immediately. Well, release the Cuban prisoners. I, Connie, I'm not going to get involved in a negotiation uh, with uh, another country from the podium. What I can tell you is our view is unequivocal. Major, yes. Uh, I don't want to belabor this, but I'm on the Correspondents Association and I've made a pledge to all the members to protest or raise my objections on behalf of everyone. Mm -hmm. When there's a situation that could be covered and isn't covered, it is labeled to us as closed press and then almost instantaneously a White House produced photograph is released of the very news event that we have de demonstrable interest in. Mm -hmm. And we've had a long dialogue with mm -hmm. Cordial, sure. I think it's in time it's been productive. But this strikes me, and I believe it strikes other members of the association, is inconsistent with your pledge to take our concern about such news events and then almost immediate White House production of coverage of that event, which cuts us out completely. Uh, Major, all I can tell you is that my uh, pledge was sincere, and we have taken steps that I think have been acknowledged by photographers and others uh, to open access and improve access. Uh, we've had circumstances when I've offered access, and it has been uh, declined. Uh, and uh, but what I never pledged and what I can't possibly pledge and none of my successors uh, in the history of this office will pledge is that we're going to give access to every meeting the President has, even ones that are of profound interest to the press for understandable reasons. And it would just be worth putting on the record that the Dalai Lama did not object or raise objections to press coverage, did he? Uh, I, I don't have a readout from him. I'm, he's available. I, you know, he's, right. uh, he was here he's all gone. week. Yeah. He's, he's, he's never well, lost. But again, that. April, the suggestion, I mean, the, the Dalai Lama speaks with the press, uh, as I understand it, at least based on my reading of the press with, uh, you know, some frequency. So uh, he's free to do that. Would he ask not to go to speak out as well from this White House? No. Okay, on Ukraine. Is there a message the White House also has for the protesters and the opposition figures? Because they must accept some compromise in this as well. They've been taken to the streets. They've risked life and limb to seek the immediate removal of the Yanukovych government. This agreement does not set that forth. It sets elections at some point in the distance. Is the message from the White House, you have to respect that as well, and you have to take some delay and also maybe stop protesting or pull back in order to let this agreement work? Well, again, we are at uh, know, the early stages early. of implementation. But it seems like both so sides have obligations here. Well, there's no question, and certainly, as we made clear, even though we uh, are and were of the strong opinion that the Ukrainian government bore responsibility for the violence, that uh, it was incumbent upon everyone to refrain from violence, and, uh, and that's point one. Point two, the uh, agreement sought and reached called for a coalition government, and I believe there's a timetable associated with that that's quite quick. Uh, early elections, and I believe uh, that is uh, explicitly laid out in the agreement, uh, and they are um, this year. And uh, we, you know, we will see if implementation uh, is carried out. Uh, but it is uh, certainly the case that uh, thus far, the steps uh, that have been taken and agreed to reflect our view of what, and I think 
others' view of what the Ukrainian people uh, ought to have uh, as a result of this uh, dispute and confrontation. You invited us to uh, prize your expertise in the region, <laughs> and I want to do that just a bit. Why do you think it's an oversimplification or a misreading of the history to place this in not a contemporaneous Cold War context, but even in that sort of phraseology that this is a sphere of influence debate as much as anything else? Well, I guess you could certainly argue, and I wouldn't dispute it, that there are, uh, that the Moscow and, and, and the Russian government has views about uh, its interests and where they, uh, where they feel they ought to be asserted. And we have profound disagreements with uh, Russia on some of these uh, matters, most notably Syria. What I think is wholly distinct is the uh, analogy to uh, a Cold War conflict where, in many cases, some of these uh, disagreements were, uh, you know, created, there were conflicts that were simply proxy conflicts. And that is not the case because uh, the Ukrainian people are not substitutes for anyone in this conflict. They are representing themselves and their nation. Uh, they are expressing their desires, not U.S. desires or European desires. And our position is only that their desires be uh, listened to by their government. Uh, and uh, that's what democracy is all about. And I think uh, what we've seen transpire uh, is wholly different from you know, the kinds of things that happened in, uh, you know, during the height of the Cold War. You mentioned Syria. I've got one more on that. The, the Vice President's been on the phone twice this week with Yanukovych for an hour each time. Mm -hmm. that's a, even when you account, as you inevitably would have to, for translation time, that's a lot of time on the phone. Mm -hmm. Can you describe his interaction with the President on these phone calls and how closely the Vice President's role in talking to Yanukovych, sensing his willingness or ability to compromise or move forward. How did this week play out in this building with this kind of heavy involvement of the vice president? Well, I think the the uh, number of and duration of the of the conversations reflect the seriousness that we uh, with which we view the circumstances in Ukraine, uh, and the fact that the vice president was making these calls uh, reflects uh, how seriously the president views uh, this matter. The Vice President was very blunt in uh, explaining our views and uh, making clear that the violence that was taking place was unacceptable and that uh, we were, like others, prepared to take action and uh, in impose sanctions. Something that, that held the or counseled the president not to unleash sanctions right away to give this a little bit more time to play out. Was there was something he was well, detecting in this, these conversations that he conveyed? The, to the president? circumstances obviously were very fluid, and and uh, it, part of the conversations were uh, in, part of the conversations included uh, urging President Yanukovych to have a dialogue with the opposition to agree to a coalition government, to agree to early elections, to agree to being responsive to the Ukra you know, the hopes and desires of the Ukrainian people that we were seeing expressed on the streets in Kiev and elsewhere. So uh, I, I'm not, I, I think that well, there are a lot of shared interests and shared views on this, and, and uh, I'm not suggesting cause and effect, but I think that the, uh, there was a, uh, the Vice President was very clear, as the President was, in expressing our views. On Syria, there was a principals meeting here yesterday, and there is a general sense that either new options are being considered or the president has asked for some brand new or at least creative, newly creative thinking about what to do now that a Geneva appears to be a dead end, the violence continues, the human rights and human suffering escalates. Give us the latest thinking and what was the mm -hmm. either agenda or culmination or did anything come out of that principals meeting yesterday? Well, I'd say a couple of things. It is simply a fact that the President has, uh, for a long time, been tasking his team uh, with coming up with uh, options available to him on Syria. 
So there's not a new review or a new process that has been started or is being completed. This is an ongoing assessment of options with um, the president urging his team to uh, make sure that we're exploring all possibilities. I know there's been a lot of speculation about what ideas we're considering, but I don't have any details uh, to read out to you. I think that, again, except to rebut the notion that this is a new review of some sort, because there has been an ongoing assessment and reassessment of uh, what is obviously a horrendous situation in Syria and an assessment of what steps we can take in addition to the uh, highest level of humanitarian assistance and in addition to the assistance that we provide to the opposition. This is an assessment under a different backdrop, meaning that Geneva now looks less likely to produce something positive and new thinking must be applied because that's a new reality. We've made clear in the run-up to and uh, in the wake of the uh, first meetings in the Geneva process that the prospect for success there was far from guaranteed that this was going to be a long and hard road. We've also made clear that there is no other alternative, whether you call it Geneva or something else, to a negotiated political settlement. So the options we look at in terms of U.S. policy start from the premise that in the end, Syria's future has to be decided through a negotiation, and that there's not, a, there's not a military solution to this conflict. We are also obviously looking at ways that we can provide as much help as possible to a Syrian population that is suffering tremendously. We are uh, aggressively at work yeah, in New York at the United Nations Security Council uh, on a resolution to open humanitarian aid corridors. Uh, and that work continues uh, and uh, this, the, today and this week, and I think uh, we will see a vote soon on a resolution. We are also looking at, with our partners and allies, uh, how we provide assistance to the opposition. And I can uh, tell you that yesterday we completed delivery of non-lethal assistance to Supreme Military Council commanders through the North. Remember, it had been suspended because of an issue with uh, custody and making sure that uh, the assistance we're providing was getting into the right hands. And uh, we were able to complete a delivery uh, yesterday of non-lethal assistance. Uh, so that process continues, and we work not just unilaterally but with our partners in, in assessing what uh, needs are and what assistance uh, is most helpful and in assessing uh, who the aid is going to. Yes. And then Steve. Yeah, you first. Thanks. Thank uh, Two questions. Oh, on Dalai Lama. First, when did the President decide to meet the uh, Dalai Lama? Was this a long scheduled uh, meeting? Uh, I don't have a date on that. Again, I think the Dalai Lama was here on other business. Uh, and in the way that has taken place in the past, the President had a meeting with him while he was here in town. Yeah, right after the President met with, the president met with uh, uh, Dalai Lama, uh, Vice President Biden is going to swear in Senator uh, Bocas to be the ambassador to China. So what's the implication here? What's the message? I, that there's no <laughs> connection between the two. Uh, Senator Bocas was confirmed, uh, and the Vice President looks forward to, I'm sure, uh, si uh, swearing him in if he hasn't already. Uh, and uh, uh, we look forward, as an administration and a nation, to having uh, Ambassador Bacchus uh, represent the United States in Beijing. Wendell. Oh, um, no, wait, you know, I said Steve, and then one. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. <coughs> there have been a few reports this week that the U.S. has agreed a new way with its Arab allies, particularly of identifying rebels uh, and supplying rebels in Syria with weapons and other aid. Uh, are they correct? Ah. It's correct to say that we're working with uh, our European and Arab allies to uh, assess how we provide assistance. It's, I don't think it's correct to say that uh, we found a new way. The fact is we are in close and continuing touch with our European and al Arab allies on the issue of Syria and on the issue of provision of aid. And just last week, National Security Advisor Susan Rice and 
uh, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, Lisa Monaco, met with Saudi Minister of Interior uh, Prince Mohammed bin Nayef bin Ab Al Aziz Al Saud, and Syria was among the topics discussed. And I think that reflects the kind of coordination we have uh, with our uh, partners and allies on this subject. I in terms of the assessments made about where aid should go and making sure it goes to the moderate opposition, uh, we have long said that we urge the international community to channel its support for the Syrian people through the established uh, channels to the moderate armed and political opposition. This has been an objective of ours for quite some time. It's one that we've talked about explicitly in this room for uh, a long, long time. And it is normal that these discussions occur with our allies on how best to coordinate our support. Uh, any move in this direction is welcome, and we continue to proceed with this in mind. I know it's a secret that the U.S. and the Saudis have been somewhat differing in their approach to this. The President's going to Saudi Arabia next month. Are you even able to say if the coordination is? has tightened on this, if it's in better shape than it perhaps was before? Look, I think that it is uh, absolutely correct to say that there are many uh, in the international community, including obviously the United States, who are uh, committed to supporting the Syrian people uh, in uh, f the fulfillment of their aspirations. And the best chance for us collectively uh, to help the Syrian opposition to achieve uh, a new Syria is if uh, we you know, operate together uh, if we're united and organized uh, as we pursue our shared aims. So uh, I think that has long been a goal, and it is one that we discuss uh, frequently with our European and Arab allies. Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that sort of general approach that uh, has been in existence for some time, I don't have a specific uh, readout of discussions or uh, how we coordinate with our allies on these issues, except to confirm that we, we certainly do, and that it is our view that coordination uh, is uh, an important component to making the assistance we provide effective. Uh, Wendell, and then Alexis. A couple no, of then subjects. And then Peter, then Alexis. Yeah. The um, decision to drop change CPI from the 2015 budget proposal, is that, as the Washington Post characterized it, uh, the President's way of calling for the end of austerity? Yeah. No. I, I, thought, I saw another uh, Washington Post item that suggested that uh, Republicans killed the effort because, as we've noted, uh, well, first of all, we don't accept the idea that it's dead because the offer remains on the table. But as we noted, I think, uh, with a lot of voices yesterday, including my colleague Josh Ernest, uh, the exception to the rule when it comes to presentation of budgets uh, by presidents was made last year when President Obama uh, did something unusual, which was include basically Republican demands. Uh, as part of the negotiations he had had with Speaker Boehner in his own budget because we were hopeful that by doing so we could make some progress with Republicans in pursuit of a balanced uh, deal towards further deficit reduction. As you know, and maybe even reported, uh, Republicans didn't take us up on that offer despite repeated meetings with the President, with our Chief of Staff, uh, and, uh, look, it was noted here that that was a pretty big deal to put that offer in the budget. What the budget this year will reflect is the President's vision on how we can best uh, fund our government uh, so that it provides expanded opportunity for all Americans, so that it uh, rewards hard work and responsibility. If Republican leaders are interested in uh, accepting the premise that there's a tax loophole out there, for the wealthy and well-connected that ought to be closed as part of a balanced package towards a deficit reduction, then yes, the offer remains on the table. And uh, the President would be willing to have uh, that provision included in a balanced package. That provision, which Republicans made clear, was one of their number one priorities when it came to deficit reduction. So uh, what you'll see when the budget comes out is a uh, is an approach that the President believes is the, the best way forward, but he remains interested in, if, if the Republicans would show some desire for or willingness for compromise, in uh, a balanced uh, package of, for, towards deficit reduction. And you would deny, then, the uh, suggestion that this was made to rally progressives who very strongly opposed the chain CPI proposal? Well, I, I guess, Wendell, what I would say is, 
the offer's still on the table. What we've all seen is uh, a profound unwillingness of Republicans to make the same kind of move, which is uh, uh, putting on the table their own, uh, a, a, a democratic condition to a balanced deficit reduction package. Remember, this is change CPI was something Republicans identified as one of their top priorities. Public, uh, the President put it on the table as part of an offer towards the Speaker uh, uh, to try to find some common ground on de reducing the deficit further. I would note contextually that uh, two things. First of all, under this President, the deficit has come down faster than at any time since World War II. The deficit is uh, meeting the target of being cut by half and then some. The deficit has a share of GDP and within the 10-year window will be below 2 percent, not 3 percent as identified by Simpson Bowles, but 2 percent. Uh, so these are not insignificant accomplishments. Uh, I would also note that when the President took office, uh, he was handed the largest deficit in history at that time. Uh, some might say that was a result in part of policies that Republicans supported. Uh, having been delivered the first surpluses in a long, long time, eight years on, uh, prior. On a different subject, shockingly. Yes, sir, can you get a uh, clarification? You just said that Republicans said change CPI was one of their top priorities. When did they say that? In our negotiations. Oh, and you're okay, so no, no, no public. I, I think there's ample evidence that they had, uh, that, that they were very interested in having this generally, uh, but there's no question that uh, this is, that I, I, this is not something uh, I think is demonstrated by Wendell's question. Uh, this was a give as part of a give and take. Because I've never seen them propose it up, up on the Hill. I mean, I, so. uh, that's shocking, too, right? Uh, Wendell, did you have a second one? Yes, I did. It involves the FCC's um, newsroom proposal, something it calls a, a multi market study of critical information needs, which involves interviewing people like us, our editors, our producers, uh, about how we choose. Um, what to put on the air, what's important to mm -hmm. us. Uh, does the White House have, have a reaction to the FCC's decision to study this? Are you, are you in favor of it? Do, do you believe that the FCC should be interviewing well, people involved? I think in you're, a, you're, you're slightly behind the news. The FCC is an independent agency, a, uh, so you'd have to talk to them for details. But I've seen these reports, and I understand the FCC chairman has taken steps to address the concerns uh, that have been expressed, including the ones uh, that you just laid out. Uh, but for details, I'd urge you to talk to the FCC about their decisions. You don't want to talk about the FCC's It's an independent to agency, this. so we're not going to uh, weigh in on that. But I would note what the uh, chairman has said and the actions that he's taken. Peter. At least leading up to today, the message to Yanukovych from uh, the Russians had basically been, do not compromise. The Putin's prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, even urge Ukraine to be tougher. The language and translation was so people don't wipe their feet on the authorities like a doormat. I'm curious your reaction to that. You know, you're going to have to repeat the question, Peter. The, the, there had been a comment just recently, in the recent days, by Dmitry Medvedev, the prime minister of uh, Russia, who had effectively said to uh, to the Russians that this was important to, to, to Ukraine. Excuse me, to Yanukovych, that this was important. To, and the translation was so that people don't wipe their feet on the authorities like a doormat. I'm just curious what your well, thoughts are. I didn't on. see that comment. Obviously, there uh, have been uh, a number of uh, words and, more importantly, actions that we've disagreed with when it comes to the situation in Ukraine, not least the violence perpetrated upon peaceful protesters, but and then the overall violence that uh, we saw. Uh, so I don't have a specific reaction to that. I would point you to the fact that uh, at this stage, anyway, we welcome the agreement signed today between Ukrainian President Yanukovych and opposition leaders, an agreement that, if implemented, uh, reflects a path forward that uh, is in keeping with what we have advocated, which is early elections, uh, a change to the Constitution, and uh, a coalition government. So we will be very uh, closely monitoring uh, how this process moves forward. but. It is certainly uh, a significant step in the right direction compared to where we were 24 hours ago. What is the U.S. national security interest? I understand the desire for democracy there in, you know, earlier elections, 
and the like constitutional reform, what, what is the national security interest for the U.S. in Ukraine? I'd say two things. One, uh, supporting the Ukrainian people in the achievement of their aspirations, which is a democratic government that reflects their will, uh, is uh, important in and of itself. Ukraine is a large nation in Europe, a nation of 46 million people, an important country. And uh, it is certainly our view that uh, Ukrainians ought to be able to choose their future. Uh, but that would hold true if they were uh, a much smaller nation. The former Ukrainian Prime Minister uh, Yulia Tymoshenko mm -hmm. was or is to be freed if she hasn't already after two and a half years behind bars, uh, a conviction that was largely viewed as political. White House's thought on that? Uh, we have repeatedly called on uh, the government of Ukraine uh, to end its use of selective prosecutions, and that includes uh, the prosecution of former Prime Minister Tymoshenko, and we are hopeful that she will be released from prison uh, so she can receive the medical treatment that she needs. Quickly, I know the President's going to speak to Russia, uh, to Vladimir Putin today, if he hasn't already, and then yesterday I know he spoke to Angela Merkel. Can you give us a sense of what his engagement has been on this directly, either with the Russians or with others in the days leading up to this? He's been deeply engaged and uh, briefed uh, regularly on developments there uh, and has had, as we've read out, conversations uh, with uh, Chancellor Merkel, with uh, Prime Minister Harper uh, and, and President Peña Nieto when he was in Mexico. And obviously, as you know, uh, the Vice President has been, as well as Secretary Kerry and others, having direct discussions with President Yukashenko and, and, and then others have been having conversations with uh, opposition leaders. So uh, the President's been very directly engaged. The President has uh, tasked senior members of his team to be directly engaged. This is obviously a significant uh, issue and uh, it is the primary subject of the conversation the President uh, is having or has had with uh, President Putin. And, and briefly, because I think he's probably affected the, the, the lives of a lot of people that sit in this room, and perhaps yours as well, but uh, today Garrick Utley passed away, a longtime a, a Chicagoan. The President certainly is familiar with him, and I'm just curious if the President had heard of his passing or had any thoughts on his loss. I, I confess I haven't had that conversation with the President. It, he's uh, had a lot on his plate today, but I, I know that uh, it's, a, it's a sad day when someone of uh, Mr. Utley's stature passes from our former, my former profession, yours, uh, current, uh, uh, and uh, our hearts, uh, our, our condolences go out and our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. Mark. Okay. Oh, sure. Alexis and then Mark, sorry. So uh, the President's spending time with governors, obviously, um, in the next couple of days and today. Can you um, remind us in a concrete way what the President hopes to do to see more Democrats uh, win in elections as governors? The President's going to be talking about policy with uh, governors. Uh, and he believes that good policy is good politics. He's talking about raising the minimum wage. He is commending uh, governors who have uh, taken action or expressed a desire to take action uh, at the state level to raise the minimum wage because no American, no matter what state they live in, uh, ought to work 40 hours a week and live in poverty. So uh, that's going to be the focus of his conversation. And there's a host of agenda items that he looks forward to discussing with Democratic governors, but also uh, with uh, governors of both parties, uh, that he believes will help our recovery continue, will help expand opportunity and reward hard work. Uh, that's what he's focused on. He's not, he's not, uh, he's obviously has a role to play and will play it very vigorously you know, when it comes to the midterm elections. Uh, but he's, he believes we have a lot of business we can get done as a nation. And that, as we've been pretty clear about, uh, not everything that we can get done as a nation uh, has to pass through Congress. It can happen in state houses, it can happen in city councils, uh, and it can happen through public private partnerships and through simply convening uh, people to come together to take action to move forward <laughs> on an agenda. And that's what the President's been doing all year. Uh, and that's. Uh, reflects the kind of conversations he's going to be having with governors. One other quick follow-up. Um, David Pluff and Mr. Messina and Bob Bauer came into Who? the West Wing, yes, <coughs> came into the West Wing lobby midday uh, for a meeting. Uh, were they meeting with the president? Could you uh, tell I, us what they were? I, I don't think they were, but, you know, they're obviously they uh, come by every once in a while. Um, 
but I don't have any specifics on their meeting. I don't. Uh, who did I promise? Mark. Uh, Jay, what is the reason that today's meeting with the Dalai Lama, like his, like President Obama's two previous meetings, took place in the map room and not in the Oval Office? Uh, the President, uh, as we read out, uh, met with His Holiness uh, in uh, the Dalai Lama's capacity as a religious and cultural leader. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, I, I think I made clear what our position is uh, when asked about uh, Tibet, and uh, that's, you know, so he had the meeting uh, in the map room. But uh, again, this is, reflects uh, uh, the kinds of meetings that this president has had with the Dalai Lama in the past and past presidents have had with the Dalai Lama. Is a map room meeting a degree lower than an Oval Office meeting? Uh, I think when you meet with the president, you're always meeting with the president. Thanks, Carol? Just and then, that's, that's Carol, and then I did say Dan. Yeah. Who initiated the call with President Putin? I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, I suspect it was us, but I'm not. I'll, we'll get back to you. Yeah. And can you just give a sense of your, he's doing an, president's doing an economic event in Minneapolis next week. What is the focus of that? Expanding opportunity. Expanding opportunity. Rewarding hard work. To whom? And we'll have more way. details on it. I, in fact, I have a week ahead and maybe, uh, uh, well, you're not going to get a lot of joy out of that. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But we will certainly have more detail for you in uh, in coming days. Dan? Can I just ask you about the uh, attack by al-Shabaab, at least they claim responsibility in Somalia. 17 people dead, apparently 15 separate attackers. And what this says about not only security in Somalia, but the threat from al-Shabaab uh, more generally. I think we heard about a threat in uh, Kampala in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. What that says uh, about the threat that that group still poses, what the U.S. is ready Well, I think is, I don't have a specific reaction to that. Uh, report, but I can tell you that we have been, uh, as a general matter, focused on and concerned about al-Shabaab, as well as other uh, extremist groups affiliated with al-Qaeda, and, uh, and especially as relates to our concerns that these groups might have designs on the United States or our allies. Uh, but I don't have anything specific on this attack. Uh, I can take the question and see if we can get anything for you. I'm not sure if State has, has put anything out. I think Scott. Yeah, oh, wait, yeah, you're reading from your Blackberry. Is that is that breaking news? It looks as if two cases of White House beer will be going north. Lost one, nothing. That is a shame. But I. Uh, if Harper said you can keep the beer for Keystone, does the President have any thoughts? Uh, that house, that process is uh, housed over at the State Department. And <laughs> it's a lot more costly. It's uh, entirely unfermented. Um, Maybe a case we're, we're of see you in a, well, uh, it sounds like uh, I didn't obviously see. I did watch uh, yesterday's game, uh, which was just uh, exhilarating and heartbreaking. But uh, uh, what I caught of this game seemed uh, just as stressful uh, for uh, fans to watch. But. Congratulations to Canada. They certainly know their way around the hockey rink. Week ahead. The week ahead, yes. On Sunday evening, the President and First Lady will host uh, the governors in town for the winter meeting for a dinner at the White House. On Monday, the President will meet with the National Governors Association. On Tuesday, the President will hold an event on the economy at the White House. Uh, in the evening, uh, when, uh, Tuesday, he will attend an Organizing for Action event in Washington, D.C. On Wednesday, the President will travel to the Minneapolis-St. Paul area for an event on the economy. On Thursday, the President will host an event, as uh, I noted the other day, on his My Brother's Keeper initiative. And on Friday, the President will attend a DNC event here in Washington, D.C. I hope you all have a splendid weekend. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jay.